Hello and welcome to the World Soccer Talk podcast, your weekly dose of talking about watching soccer on TV, online and apps. Coming up on episode 37, we discuss the impact that the International Champions Cup and a $4 billion TV deal offer are having on Major League Soccer, as well as a new fantasy game from the Premier League, plus big news for fans of Scottish football. So my name is Christopher Harris, a.k.a. The Gaffer, and I'm joined today by Kartik Krishnaya. Kartik, fresh off the, uh, what should, can only be called a, uh, a whirlwind of games on Wednesday night, but uh, you were at the uh, PSG Juventus game. Yeah, I was at the P- PSG Juventus game in Miami, and it was uh, it was an entertaining game, really good quality game. You can see why when you watch a game of this quality, even though it's a friendly, and I know I've talked about the, the sophistication of American audiences understanding that these games are meaningless, but when you see the quality on the pitch and just the quality of touches, the quality of shape and movement, and particularly from Juventus, even more. PSG has a lot of flair players, a lot of guys that are, are fun to watch, but just the quality of tactics from Max Allegri's side. Um, you you understand why so many people are willing to spend big bucks uh, on this game. It was $40 for parking. It was um, uh, tickets were, were uh, uh, very, very expensive uh, in the hundreds of dollars. Why they're willing to spend money for these games and not go to domestic uh, soccer, which I think is a little bit disappointing and sad, but it's something that is a reality that authorities in the game in this country have to accept and deal with and i think we'll talk a little bit about that later yeah we, we will week. definitely get into this uh big time because it, it is a uh a huge topic and it's a topic that a lot of people are not talking about they're conveniently ignoring it hoping it goes away it's not going away so we'll get into that in a bit but first of all congratulations to the u.s team on the uh deserved uh i think Concacaf uh, gold cup uh champion championship there beating jamaica jamaica was um uh, this was really tough, too, because there were so many games on last night. There was like, what, four or three ICC games, and then there was the Gold Cup game. Then there was also uh, Chivas against Santos in the Copa MX, uh, and, and there was other games on, too. But, um, but I thought that the U.S. played extremely well. Jamaica put up a really good fight, and uh, losing Andre Blake to that injury in, in about the 20th yeah. minute, that really set them back. But uh, in terms of the television coverage, I, I didn't have any complaints, really. It was one of those things where... I tuned into the game, watched the game. Uh, at halftime, I uh, went back to one of the ICC games, which would have been the, uh, I think, the PSG Juventus game. Once uh, for about fifteen minutes, went then back to uh, the second well, half and, can, and watched the game. Can I can I ask you a question, a very frank question about Fox? Sure. Because obviously I didn't watch the game. I was at this ICC game at the same time. Did they acknowledge this was a Jamaican B side? It absolutely. If you look at the. T- uh, guys, Jamaica typically calls in other than Andre Blake, the goalkeeper, and a couple of guys, the young Kmar Lawrence uh, from Red Bulls, others, a few others, was a B side. There were probably more regular stars for the United States playing last night than regular stars and guys who had an influence on the 2015 Gold Cup game when the U.S. lost to Jamaica, uh, playing for the U.S. and playing for Jamaica. Was that it all discussed in Fox's coverage? To be honest, I'm not sure because I, I, I didn't uh, tune in for the pre-match. I, I tuned in for maybe a few minutes just to, just to see who was on the set. I, I, but... I just wonder because I think that there's this, there's this um, uh, narrative that uh, the U.S. Is, is playing an experimental squad, a B squad. Now, of course, if Klinsman were the manager, they would have savaged them for it, right? Oh, the results aren't good enough or the performances aren't good enough. Uh, but there isn't the kind of dis- – and there's an acknowledgement Mexico came to the tournament with that as well. There isn't enough of a discussion of the fact that everybody in CONCACAF were playing largely experimental squads other than Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they uh, So – um, I just wonder about that because the, the Costa Rica team the U.S. beat was not Costa Rica's full team. The, the guys that were really influential players on that team got recalled by their European clubs uh, uh, before that semifinal when this, the change of the six players was made. Uh, that, the same thing can be said for the team that pa- uh, the U.S. played, the Panamanian team in the first game of the tournament, not their full team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's uh, – I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't mention that at, at all. Uh, it was – I mean, not surprisingly, again, a rah-rah kind of USA um, – uh, really kind of a experience from from Fox there too at the end of the final at the final whistle it sounded like as if uh, the US had won the World Cup the way that uh, John Strong and uh, especially for the win- the winning goal in terms of the the call on that I thought it was a little bit over the top yes this is the Gold Cup and yes we all want to see the US uh, do well and, and win these tournaments but at the same, same time Kartik you know, know I know probably a, a lot of our listeners know too that this was 
very much a, a B level, sometimes C level level of competition in terms of uh, the, the teams that these uh, nations were fielding. So we have to keep that into context. But uh, but all in all, in terms of Fox's performance, at least, uh, well, at the very, very end, at the final whistle, it goes, they go back to Rob Stone, and the first thing that Rob Stone says, here we go. Like uh, This is now 14 unbeaten games for Bruce Arena in charge of this U.S. men's national team, which is all well and good. But when you play teams like uh, Martinique, and you play teams like El Salvador and Nicaragua um, and a, a Costa Rica B team and a Jamaica B team and, and, and these other teams. You know, I mean, we're not playing the Argentina, Chile's, Brazil's, you know, Germany's of the world. Um, so it's a good confidence boost. But again, too, I think from Rob Stone, it's very much rah-rah USA. And that feeds into the again, audience. Again, if Klinsmann, right, if Klinsman goes on a similar run... Um, there, there isn't that conversation, right? It's not. Uh, it, it's basically all the flaws. How, why did we struggle against Martinique? Why did we struggle against El Salvador? How could we struggle against a Jamaican B team? It would probably be pointed pointed out if Klinsman were the manager that it was a Jamaican B team. And I am not a fan of Klinsman. People who follow me on Twitter know that. That I felt like he was um, a, a substandard manager, horribly horrible tactically, and a wrong fit for this program. But here's uh, just a reflection on the conversation I had last night with another journalist about this very topic, Chris. Basically, this person told me, look, at some point, all of us who are concerned and uh, about Fox's coverage and complain about Fox's coverage, just disengage. Watch the Premier League. Watch U.S. games on Univision. Watch U.S. games on Telemundo. Uh, there are U.S. fans. They feel like they have to, to gin up um, patriotism and uh, overplay how good the team is uh, to just to the to the audience so maybe you just accept that and uh if you want to consume the games go consume them somewhere else or some other way and maybe that's the point some of us are at well that's that's the big question because uh univision had this game on too so it'll be interesting to see what the tv numbers are for this one i mean he had uh, usa against jamaica so it's a very english speaking audience so how does univision uh do in the tv ratings compared to fs1 fs1 should be a slam dunk with an english speaking uh audience and with the united states in the final, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what Univision does with those numbers and how close they get. But it's interesting too, Kartik, because I, I didn't catch this, so I watched the, the Fox broadcast. Uh, Oliver Say, who uh, occasionally writes for World Soccer Talk, uh, sent me an email, and he was uh, explaining how uh, it was Santos against Chivas, which is the Copa MX, uh, or MX uh, a game that was on right before uh, the Gold Cup final on Univision. And in this one, the reason that the, the, the time kickoff time had been pushed back to 9.50 uh, Eastern time was because of the Copa MX game. They wanted to have that game over and done with on Univision and then go over to uh, the U.S.-Jamaica um, uh, final. I'm sure they were hoping it was U.S.-Mexico final, but that's another story. So he said that uh, Univision ran commercials after the Santos-Chivas Copa MX match ended late, and that was past 9.50 Eastern time. By the time Univision finished running commercials, the Gold Cup match had already started. What did Univision do? U Univision tried to cover it up. Uh, what it did was, one, it showed the kickoff of the Gold Cup final on tape delay, so the kickoff was on tape delay. And then they had a quick cutaway shot of Bruce Arena that allowed Univision then to skip the first four minutes of the match to get up to live action. And then they didn't display the clock on the score, gra score graphic until five minutes into the match. So to kind of ca catch people by surprise and, and then hope that they didn't notice that the game actually had already kicked off and then try to catch up magically. Thank God for Univision that... Uh, had nobody scored in the first five minutes. That would have been completely embarrassing. But interesting tactics there from Univision, and and it's tough. It's it's one of those situations they, like what do you do may, when that happens? They may not have. They may not have known. Well, they may not have done it if someone had scored, let's say, in the second minute, because by that time they know, and then they right. probably do it. They don't put the score bug uh, score bug at the top. They probably do it like between minutes ten and fourteen. Um, but it's I I. I empathize with them, actually. I'm not sure what you do in that situation. Yeah. And it's live television, so it's difficult. So you have to make that call right. I mean, kind of right. I mean I'm sure they saw that the uh, as the game was going on with the Copa MX game that uh, it was going to run over into the U.S. game. But, yeah, that's difficult. That's a high-pressure stakes uh, in television. Um, uh, God bless them. All right, Kartik, so in terms of what we've been watching this past week, other than the, the Gold Cup final, um, for me personally, I've been watching uh, a ton of International Champions Cup games. And uh, I must say that 
this year's edition, I think, has been the most competitive I've ever seen. Competitive on the pitch, and um, in terms of the not just the uh, the starting lineups for these teams, I've been really surprised by uh, you mean how many uh, A players are starting these games, but also just the level of competition in terms of how competitive it is it for going in for tackles and end to end action. And, and there's been a bunch of games this week that we've seen that with um, the Spurs against Roma game ends up being a a 3-2 win for Roma in the last minute. That was a really entertaining match to watch. Um, And and then you had the the PSG-Juventus game, Kartik. um, You were there in person, but I watched it on television. On television, it felt uh, the atmosphere was great. Inside the the new refurbished uh, Joe Robbie Stadium, Hard Rock Stadium, it looked incredible on television. But for me, that felt like not quite a UEFA Champions League final, but it could have easily been if uh, if PSG had found their way into the final. PSG had a few players that uh, that started that usually wouldn't start um, a game, but the Juventus team was stacked, and so too was the PSG uh, team too, except for a couple of exceptions. But overall, I've been really pleasantly surprised about how competitive ICC has been, and if anything, it's been more uh, competitive and more entertaining uh, and watchable than than the Gold Cup. Oh, it's certainly been more entertaining than the Gold Cup or watchable than the Gold Cup. Uh, CONCACAF, look, the, the, the thing about the Gold Cup every two two years, I, I think I talked about this last week or the week before, is that you have theatrics, you have play acting, you have uh, the kinds of things that either get you very angry or motivate you to watch because something outrageous is going to happen. That That's the tournament even when it's an A, a tournament. And uh, by the way, this year – we're not the only ones saying that the tournament has been remarkably bad from a football perspective. But I I think uh, you've seen a combination of teams playing very competitively and very aggressively. This is going to be a long year. This is a world cup year. So uh, basically the guys you're seeing play football right now for these big clubs, a lot of them are going to be playing all the way through mid July of next year and then get a two or three week play break in. And, and I don't know with Qatar in 2022, how schedules are going to be configured, but you might start seeing uh, uh, European seasons uh, shifted. Maybe it'd be the following year to, um, to, to start playing into that 2022 world cup. So it's going to be a busy year. And I think guys are probably fitter, hungrier and sharper this preseason because they know the st- Stakes, how, how good the stakes, uh, how big the stakes are. I think we saw this in the ICC in 2013, actually, Chris, the very first ICC. Mm-hmm. And then the play dropped off in 14, which is right after a World Cup. I, I don't think the the games have been were particularly good in 15 or 16 either. Uh, but you're right, they have been good this year. Most teams playing their starters. Uh, last night, PSG didn't didn't have Julian Draxler. He's still um, coming back from the Confed Cup, uh, where he led Germany to uh, to the title, and uh, and Kevin Trapp, who who had been suspended he'd been sent off in the previous game in orlando but um it was basically a full team uh, some managers are treating it differently though uh, we have to talk about the man united man city game last week where uh, uh out of the blue pep Guardiola uh started phil foden 17 year old yeah. academy player from uh stockport he was and incredible gave him, and gave him about 80 minutes yeah and he was fantastic he was brilliant and i was like it's just a, a a breath of fresh air just seeing him on the pitch yeah. and seeing what he was doing right and this this is uh uh just uh a week or two after he had led uh, or a couple of weeks after he had led uh england in the uh in the u17s uh you were u17 so he, he's a very uh very polished young local player which is what we want to see at manchester city a little bit of a to-do between Pep and uh, and Gary Neville, uh, Neville saying, "Well, he's at the wrong Manchester club as a local guy uh, to develop." And you know, recent evidence might suggest that. Although, mm-hmm. uh, in the period between uh, um, the emergence of, of, let's say, Danny Welbeck and uh, the class of '92, that 20-year period or 15-year period, Man City was producing better local players coming through their system so um you know this thing is cyclical but that game was 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 good i want to point out that game for a specific reason which is um this is preseason and we know um the icc isn't necessarily staffed or uh handled with there are roster registration rules etc for the tournament but it's not quite and the public information isn't quite like a regular league it's not like covering major league soccer or the premier league or the bundesliga a game in one of those leagues where you can find the registered players there's, there's certain procedures so Derek ray and, and craig burley uh, were on the call for espn they did a fantastic job this just shows you the kind of pro Derek ray is and how 
some other commentators might have had a more difficult time with it. Um, they had guys playing in that game that weren't on the squad sheet that were given um, to the two commentators. They had guys um, that were high number players uh, that were um, not on the squad sheet. They had guys like uh, Gabriel Jesus, who is a big superstar, right, mm -hmm. from Man City, who was not on the squad sheet. Um, the bottom line is that they were able to um, to work through it and uh, able to identify, uh, oh, uh, this guy's on the pitch, uh, that guy's on the pitch, let's f find out who this is. Uh, Jesus, they knew who he was, but he hadn't been on their squad sheet. So, um, and again, I think uh, Ray and Burley were, were remote, right? They weren't at the, at the venue. So um, that, that might have complicated it, but it just, to me, once again, point out what a pro Derek Ray is, one of the best in the business. Craig Burley right up there with him. And, and a reminder for people who are newer or don't remember, per se, uh, to the sport, uh, those two paired a lot on games uh, when uh, Craig Burley was still based in the U.K. And um, they've paired a fair amount on games uh, during the summer since Burley moved to the U.S. So it's an all-Scottish team. I know the accents might annoy some people who listen, but I, I love having those two guys call games, and I love having Derek Ray team with Stuart Robson. I'm, that's been one of the great thrills of the ICC for me is that you're getting um, Ray, Burley, uh, uh, Robson, uh, a, a lot more of Twelman, which which uh, I, I love, uh, you know, guy, uh, and and all of the ESPN commentators uh, in the uh, in the booth. Uh, just finishing up on what I watched this week, also besides uh, a, a hang couple. On, of hang on, hang on, Kartik, hang on. So, so, so the, Man oh. the, the Manchester derby, though, I mean, to me, it was a really entertaining game, and it was especially the first half. And I thought that uh, this was a lot more entertaining than than an uh, average Manchester derby in the Premier League, because you know, I mean, Jose and, and his kind of uh, very kind of going for a nil nil uh, draws type of thing um, has made some of those derbies a little bit uh, well, a, a lot uh, uh, boring. But uh, this one was really um, breath taken to watch and just a really pleasant game second half kind of dragged a bit but the first half was really uh top stuff and then Kartik I would yeah. I would I would also echo in terms of uh I'm sorry to interrupt here but as far as ESPN's coverage have been uh, really uh pleasantly well actually no, you're not even surprised at all but pleasant uh pleasantly amused by um the actual uh, commentary, for example, the Real Madrid Manchester United game. Uh, there was some really lovely, dry English humour from John Champion in, in this match with Craig Burley. So there's some back and forth. And at one point in the game, too, uh, John Champion was talking about uh, having drinks in a bar the night before with uh, fans of the U.S. men's national team. And uh, just the banter back and forth between uh, John Champion and, and Craig Burley kind of trying to talk through that as far as what they got up to. That was interesting. It, and it didn't uh, divert from the match itself. It was during a lull in the game. Um, I would say, though, too, the Barcelona Man United match on Wednesday night, I'm not sure if there were audio uh, difficulties or if it was that uh, anyway the, the the John Champion Craig Burley the audio wasn't the greatest it sounded muffled at time at times I'm sure if it was the crowd noise or what it was but it was hard to understand Craig Burley at times and I'm not sure again too if that was the noise level or if he was talking too fast or if he was mumbling a bit but uh, it, that was in direct contrast to Derek Ray and Stuart Robson that did the PSG Juventus game. And both of those came through loud and clear. Um, and it was easy to hear them and easy to understand. Um, but overall, so far, I've been really uh, impressed by uh, ESPN's uh, coverage. Uh, back to you, sir. Yes. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that, Chris. I, I, I want to address ESPN FC as an anchor program, as kind of a, 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 a key bumper program when ESPN is actually showing games or has a tournament uh, that they're showing at the club level. So what we've had the last four years is uh, ESPN FC as a program that covers, uh, that analyzes, breaks down cl uh, club football matches, obviously international matches also, and they, they have a lot of international football still, even though they've lost FIFA rights. Uh, but club matches that they don't have that they don't cover as a network right and that that uh they're 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 analyzing games that are shown on vn or fox or nbc or or whatever other channel uh in the united states what has been so interesting in this tournament and they didn't do this in the previous editions of the icc which they they broadcast i guess it was just last year was the first one they broadcast Correct. but um uh, that they have they have kind of utilized ESPN FC as a studio 
anchor program for this tournament. And I think, again, we, we talked about the tournament being underwhelming last year, and I don't know that there was quite the push last season, uh, last summer, to get this, this tournament in everyone's faces, uh, other than obviously the game at the Big House and, and a couple of other um, uh, examples of that. But remember, ESPN was also just coming off the Euros when this happened last year, so they, I don't think they had quite the commitment level to broadcast it. Um, what we're seeing is that they're taking advantage of the ICC. Dan Thomas, Shaka Hislop, Gab Marcotti uh, came to uh, Orlando for a couple of days to spend some time with Spurs. They got a 15-minute uh, interview with Mauricio Pochettino. Who gets that? 10, to 10 or 15 minutes mm -hmm. uh, talking about every, every aspect of the club, uh, breaking down players, uh, Vertonghen, Lloris um, on the set, Harry Kane on the set. Uh, right there with them at, at, at Disney in Orlando, which of course Disney is ESPN's parent company, so that, that was an easy arrangement, I'm sure, yeah. for them to make, but still it, it, that's uh, sometimes why synergies, companies, conglomerates work for, for, for this sort of thing, media companies. Um, so that was really good, and then this week they've had Stuart Robson in the studio all week, which to me is a treat, and he um, is so well prepared and so well studied on all of the teams in this competition and the transfer situation. And they've been able to use the, um, the, the, the fact that they have this tournament, that they're showing PSG games, they're showing Juve games, they're showing Real Madrid and Barcelona games, they're showing Spurs games, Man City games, uh, whoever else, uh, Dortmund, uh, Arsenal, Chelsea, uh, to their advantage to actually um, – have points of reference on that program that they don't necessarily have, and their entire team is is stateside mm -hmm. for a change. So Marcotti is here, um, Robson is here, Derek Ray is here, and it's been uh, it's been really good to see how they've worked this into the show. And they and it's not that they've ignored other football going on; they've been able to bring on Herc Gomez to talk a little bit about Liga MX kicking off mm -hmm. and uh, the start, and Copa MX. They've been able to bring uh, uh, Alejandro Moreno and Sa uh, uh, Seb Sal. Are in to talk a little bit about MLS. Actually, Seb Salazar can talk uh, uh, European football too. So uh, it's been a really good week uh, for ESPN FC. I know a lot of our listeners don't watch the program, although you'd be surprised. There are a lot of soccer fans here locally in South Florida that I talk to, and they watch the program religiously. And they talk to me about Craig Burley regularly, people who come even to our Boca FC games about, oh, did you see the outrageous thing Burley said the other day? Or generally, they don't think it's outrageous. They like Burley and they think that the other guys are too Americanized. But um, that's yeah. the opinion of people who are European soccer fans who come to our Boca FC games. But um, it has been a really interesting week for that program and it's a program i'm kind of a religious devotee of so maybe i'm overly enthusiastic but uh mm -hmm. I, i've been I, I i it's been much must see tv for me this week because they've got games uh buffering their actual uh program i think kartik this could be a uh, a massive point for espn in terms of soccer coverage <clears throat> and i mean international champions cup in general in terms of the level of competition at this this year's summer tournament uh, the stellar teams that we have playing, and uh, the entertainment value. If and, and actually, we're going to be listeners. We're going to be uh, Kartik and I are going to be joining ESPN this weekend for some interviews and meetings. And I'm sure we'll learn a lot from that and be able to share that back with you uh, next week and in coming weeks, as well as on the website. But I'm interested in knowing, uh, in terms of more details about the contract. I mean, how many more years is this for? And uh, this really could put ESPN back on the the club soccer map. Uh, other, than, uh, I'm talking about international club soccer map because uh, yes, we know they have the Euros, and we know that they have Major League Soccer. But outside of that, other than the occasional World Cup uh, qualifier every few months or an European occasional... European Nations Cup they're going to have. Yeah, but, but still, so other than those national games, as far as club soccer, as far as international club soccer, this could be their ticket to ride. Every summer having just some of the, the best teams from around the world um, on ESPN, on the main ESPN, with some great uh, anchor coverage and... and uh, I really think that this could be, I mean, this has already been pretty big for ESPN this summer, but this could even get bigger and bigger depending on how long that contract is for. Yeah, and let's think about this, Chris. Uh, this is an opportunity for them to engage their personnel. They have a lot of soccer personnel that uh, don't get to do a whole lot of matches, sit in a studio most of the time, Craig Burley, uh, Stevie Nichol, et cetera, Shaka, that sit in a studio and they end up doing things for ESPN International. Uh, but they don't do a whole lot necessarily club calls for ESPN. This is very different than the days of uh, – 
the inception of ESPN3, or it was ESPN360 at the time, when they used to have the the um, online rights for uh, for La Liga at times, and, and Serie A, and 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 uh, the Portuguese league, and you would hear yep. uh, uh, Tommy Smith at the time. It was uh, you know. Tommy Smith and Robbie Musto is with NBC now. You'd hear their voice uh, six, seven times a week. It seems now they don't have any of those games. Has seeing the success of how they've been able to, to to use their personnel and all of the people who are on air personalities with ESPN and, and actually Max Bredos, who's a soccer guy, uh, is from South Florida. Is going to have a bit of a homecoming this week. We'll, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, next week. Uh, being able to come back and do some soccer coverage this week with El Clasico in Miami. Mm-hmm. How they've been able to use all this personnel in the last two weeks is impressive to me. And maybe it is the trigger for ESPN as they are, are downsizing. Their, their departments, right? As they're letting personnel go, as they're, uh, they're they're retreating from a lot of the excess or overspending that they've done on, on sports rights and sports properties in the last decade. This is obviously well chronicled. This people cut the cord, etc. Uh, maybe they see the value in how they can use their personnel, and they go for what might be a cheap club football property. Maybe they do go out and try and get the football league rights. And get the League Cup with it. Right. Maybe they do go out and spend a little more uh, time and emphasis on the fact that they do have the rights to the Copa del Rey. They do have the rights to the to, to the to the German Cup. I don't know how long those rights run for, or necessarily the or the arrangements around them. And maybe they build a little more around those cup competitions. Um, it'll be interesting to see because I think this has been potentially. And you and I will ask these questions in the next few days, a dry run for uh, an audition for greater uh, club football coverage. Uh, it's it's, yeah. it's unfortunate because ESPN put all this infrastructure in place and the studio team in place after they had lost the rights to just about everything they had. So, so two things there. One is I think that they're still going to focus on more of the uh, kind of the big – uh, tournaments, so whether it's uh, International Champions Cup or uh, Nations League or um, Euro 2020, and those those big type of events, and then use um, and and they've been better better using their talent and production around those types of events, and less so. So so my intelligence in terms of some some of my sources in terms of champions uh, the championship FA Cup and several other properties that ESPN has had an opportunity to to bid on uh, I think almost all of those they've passed on so I don't think they're interested in those types of uh, more kind of the uh, I mean more of an English type of competitions but they seem to be more in terms of more of a, a world I mean, International Champions Cup, yes, you have teams from, from Europe, but it has a very global appeal to it. If you're a fan of, uh, you mean, French soccer, Spanish soccer, especially especially with the Hispanic audience, I think that's what they seem to be kind of catering more towards. And then the European competitions, I mean, people from around the world can really enjoy those type, types of high level, I mean, no matter wh- whether you're Hispanic or Anglo or whatever it is. Um, the second thing is is that, uh, and I'm not sure if you caught this, Kartik, but um, I've been really impressed by how, how ESPN, uh, and we saw this too, actually, I think it was pre-match on the Spurs-Roma game, how ESPN's uh, Marty Smith went on the road with uh, Cristiano Ronaldo through China, and he followed him along the way, did a ton of sit-down interviews, one-on-ones, and tried to get in, inside uh, Cristiano, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo's head as far as kind of uh, what type of person he is and, and what he's thinking and what his goals are and those types of questions, as well as learning more about him as an individual. And I thought that series was well done. And they've had different spots now and again where they have some additional uh, uh, video as, far as, as well as some additional interviews that they've shared. And that was on Sports Center. So they're really trying to, I think, uh, go more mainstream in some ways in terms of uh, appeal to soccer fans. But I've been really impressed by, by what I've seen. And, uh, and like I said to you, like you said to Kartik, I'm sure we'll be finding out a lot more uh, this weekend. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to um, the thing we've, we've talked about over and over again on this, this show and on this network is that uh, there is a, a clear difference in the way ESPN presents the sport uh, uh, to the way Fox does. 
And I think, again, that contrast has been vivid the last few weeks as ICC has been ongoing and the Gold Cup has been on Fox. Uh, uh, but again, we saw Fox can raise their game as they did for the Confed Cup. So the question is, did they, uh, in spite of some of the rhetoric coming out of their mouths, did they, did they learn from the types of things ESPN does? I mean, that, that is uh, the type of piece you'd like to see on Fox in World Cup coverage, assuming Portugal's there next year. Uh, Will they learn these sort of uh, things around the game that they need to do, uh, not just match coverage that uh, ESPN does so well at? I, I think they have, and I think they will, uh, which will surprise some people. But, I mean, to me, it, there's two different, huge differences. So Fox Sports under David Neal as the executive producer who did the uh, Confederations Cup, he did the Women's World Cup, and he's going to be doing the World Cup. So in terms of the level of detail, I'm sure the budget, the, the amount of talent, the amount of uh, help that's available, uh, and the attention to detail there, I th- to me, it's going to be it's going to be a world class event. And yes, Fox will make mistakes, but they'll do some things to surprise us too. And I think they'll do well. Um, the other side of Fox, which is what we see, Gold Cup and uh, Champions League and day to day, where for the most part we either ignore it or have grown grown uh, grown old with it, as far as or grown tired with it, is is the John T. Whitehead who's uh, a producer at Fox Sports and uh, kind of dumbs down the coverage for the American audience. And, and that's what we see in there. So there's actually two sides to Fox. And so for the big events, I think we'll be OK. For the, the day-to-day normal stuff, it's just uh, par for the course. They just kind of go through the motions, although they have improved that as far as the production side, the talent side still has got work to do. I, I will mention one more thing, Kartik, before we move on to the next segment. And, and, and this is – I was really – disappointed with this and and i forgot to mention it earlier was that the usa costa rica semi-final so um there's a high point and a low point the high point for me was seeing the um the shot of the um the 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 gantry for lack of a better word with uh john strong landon donovan and Stu holden and that was the moment of celebration uh on camera from the booth when uh, De- Dempsey scored the goal to equal Landon Donovan's record, and you could see just the um, emotions among all three of them, but also Landon Donovan celebrating the fact that uh, Dempsey had just tied that uh, goal-scoring record. I thought that was a great, uh, great shot and a great moment um, in the match coverage. The second thing, though, the two contact, and this is the, the low point, and I was so disappointed with this, was Eric Winalda was on, on the set. And I was like, wow, winalda has been given an opportunity, a golden opportunity to shine here, but he failed to take it. And I was so disappointed because at halftime, he was asked for his analysis, and he said roughly these words. He said, I, I'm just going to echo what Landon Von, Donovan just said, and, and uh, I think that they will play with a 4-3-3 in the second half. And that was it. So while that analysis was good, all it did was added more credence to Landon Donovan, and it didn't provide any valuable insight from Winaldo on his own terms. It was just kind of echoing what somebody else had said. Um, The challenge that he has when he's on the set is when Rob Stone kind of turns to somebody for match analysis or, or kind of tactical analysis, the first person he goes to is Ali Wagner. I mean, Ali Wagner goes into and says, okay, well, they should have been uh, playing out wide or uh, whatever she says. And then they go to Winalda. So he's in a tough position where he has to come up with something original and has like, what, 15 seconds to come up with something? Right. I was going to say, I think it's the time constraint. And, and, uh, and, and he, he, he's just not being utilized properly at that network. It's, I, and I don't, but, we but, don't have to have a whole show about yeah, it. But, but it, he, he, he could do is. better than that, though. I mean, and I was just really disappointed. Um, and I don't know if they told him, OK, you're on, on the show, but you have to kind of uh, play it cool. Don't be too negative. And maybe yeah, and I'm sure they did. <laughs> I was just I was I was really disappointed because I was really like, hoping that he would you mean deliver a, a good zinger as far as you mean some good analysis that we know he's capable of doing. But all he did just said yeah, like whatever Landon said, I agree with. And I thought like okay, come on, you, you can do better than that. Look, look, I think there's been a campaign against. It's Derek Winalda, and he made that strong word. Uh, that's a Jose Mourinho word, right? A campaign against Chelsea. But <laughs> there's been a uh, there has been a systematic attempt uh, by, by bloggers, by people on Twitter, people who are very uh, uh, supportive of Major League Soccer and U.S. Soccer and the system and and all of that uh, to marginalize his uh, his voice and marginalize his opinions. So don't think he's not conscious of that every time he goes on the air at that network. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, the, and the U.S. is a topic of discussion. Now, you, 
see in his element when that's removed, the shackles were removed. He's with Kate Abdo and with who's heating out in out in Russia talking about things that don't involve the United States, how good he can be. Yeah, or, or, on, or on his radio show on Sirius XM. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, it's, but still, I was just kind of thinking that he would provide some some analysis of his own rather than just saying, okay, yeah, I agree with what Donovan said. But, uh, ah, it is what it is. So coming up in a little bit, we've got some big news from the world of soccer, including some uh, massive news for fans of Scottish football and much more. But before we go to the break, I do want to mention our sponsor, and that's SeatGeek. Buying tickets to sports and concerts can be complicated, but there is a better, simpler way to buy, and that's with SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to live events, and with SeatGeek's seamless mobile experience, you can buy and sell tickets in just two taps. SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best prices, fully guaranteed. There's nothing quite like seeing your favorite team in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. Now, coming up this weekend, we've got El Clasico, but there's still plenty of International Champions Cup friendlies, uh, as well as other friendlies from around the world um, being played, and concerts and theater, etc. cetera. Uh, so you can use the SeatGeek app, which I have on my phone, and it's by far the easiest way I've found to shop for tickets. I can be anywhere, and just with a few taps, I can instantly find seats. Now, SeatGeek is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever. It saves you time and money by searching multiple ticket sites to compare prices and find amazing deals. And to get you the most bang for your buck, SeatGeek grades every ticket based on value to help you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. Make SeatGeek your go-to app for finding the best deals on every type of ticket, from sports and concerts to comedy and theater. Best of all, my listeners get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code WSTPOD today. That's promo code WSTPOD for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Now, Kartik, on to you for the uh, TV streaming news. Yeah, a p- pretty busy week. Uh, first off, the NASL has renewed uh, their their deal with BN Sports and BN Sports Espanol for the fall season. Uh, some of you who might follow me on Twitter and on Reddit uh, realize that I think this is quite significant for the league, not because they're renewing this deal. They've had the deal in place. Uh, the, the big component this time is that they've announced the games that are going to be in BN Sports and Espanol well in advance. We were finding out, uh, and I was working with an NASL team last year, so I know this firsthand. We were finding out week of or 10 days in advance which games were going to be on regular BN and which games were going to be on uh, on BN and Espanol. So um, that's, um, that's the... Um, that's the big thing in, now is that you have a lot of lead time to promote these games and the proper partner networks. Mm-hmm. So that's critical for the NASL because I think what we found last year was that people who were fans of NASL were going to be in uh, the English language be in and the game was on Espanol or vice versa. Now that this is being properly promoted, I think they can create uh, maybe even a separate audience for both uh, for both properties. And it's very important important that the league get um, itself better ensconced in the, in the Spanish language audience in this country. They have not done a good job of that over the course of seven years now. Uh, in other news, uh, NBC Sports app has now uh, has authentication with Fubo TV. So if you're a Fubo TV subscriber, you can go ahead and log into the NBC Sports app and use your Fubo uh, username and login to to go ahead and password to, to actually go and access that. So the great thing about it is that uh, whether it's on NBC Sports apps, which are on what well, Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, uh, or smartphones, computers, uh, etc. Uh, you don't have to be a cable subscriber to get uh, the NBC Sports app anymore. You can just get Fubo and then authenticate uh, through using your Fubo uh, login. Kartik, what's next? Uh, ESPN has added a ton of friendlies uh in the next few weeks that will be shown live on ESPN three. Uh, we have the full fixture list on the premier league schedule page on world soccer talk.com. Uh, go to world soccer talk.com uh, world soccer talk.com to find that they include Werder Bremen versus West Ham United. Uh, obviously West Ham has been very busy this summer. Wolves and Leicester Arsenal Benfica man United versus Sampdoria crystal palace versus Schalke Red Bull Leipzig are, are 
RB Leipzig, excuse me, versus Stoke, Everton versus Sevilla, Brighton uh, versus Atleti, and many others. And uh, in other news, the Premier League has launched a brand new game entitled Fantasy Premier League Draft, which is its own very own uh, draft league from different, uh, uh, which is quite different than actually the traditional fantasy league game. So any, for any of you who have played uh, draft leagues before for NFL or for um, college football, etc., cetera, uh, you can now do it with the official Fantasy Premier League Draft. Uh, both of the, the fantasy games are free and they're both separate. Uh, and, and if you're interested in playing the game, uh, you can head on over to worldsoccertalk.com on the homepage there to find out how you can play against me and other World Soccer, World Soccer Talk listeners from around the world. So, so check it out. La Liga has announced the schedule for the 17-18 season. Opening weekend will include Barcelona, Real Betis, Deportivo, Real Madrid, Sevilla, Espanyol, and Jarina and Atleti. Uh, Chris, have you noticed when the uh, Super Classico, the El Clasico fix- fixtures are? It's pretty unbelievable. Yeah, so it's Saturday, August. Uh, oh, off the top of my head, it's, I think it's. August. Oh no, no, but that's that's the that's the Supercopa, uh, the actual La Liga fixtures. Oh, oh, that's, that I have not. I uh, I know that. that okay, so the first the first match is in December. It is the last game before the hol- uh, before the Christmas break. Okay. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. So it's the last fixture in the first half of the season. And then the second fixture is the week of the Champions League semifinals. Uh, you wonder huh. if La Liga uh, might have done a better job of protecting their two giants by having those games at, at maybe a different time. Maybe it's a nice way to lead it to the uh, winter break. But, uh, boy, that game in May, that's, uh, that timing could be very awkward for both clubs, assuming they're both still alive in Champions League. Yeah. Interesting. I'll have to look at the calendar because like, oftentimes whenever there's the international break and then they have El Clasico, which has happened before, uh, it doesn't do as well because, you I mean, it's kind of that lull where everyone. Kind yeah. Of, uh, yeah. yeah. So hopefully uh, it fits in, in where it's kind of during a hectic schedule and then you have that game to kind of be the, the cherry on top. But uh, interesting. And then finally, uh, in news, uh, some big news for Scottish fans of the um, Scottish Premiership in the U.S. is that there is currently no TV deal in place. So previously, in previous years, we had uh, Fox Sports that showed some of the games on uh, Fox Soccer Plus, as well as the old firm derbies, usually at uh, on FS1 or FS2, as well as uh, Fox Soccer to Go, which had an average of about three uh, Scottish Premiership matches a, a weekend. As of right this second, there's no TV deal in place and Fox Sports is not uh, continuing with the Scottish Premiership. So what happens is, if you do want to watch your Celtic or Rangers or Aberdeen, etc., is that um, most of the Scottish Premiership sites now have streaming packages. So you can go directly to Celtic TV or Rangers TV, etc., and subscribe to a streaming package, which is for the entire season. So Rangers TV, as one example, is uh, $300 for the entire year, which gives you uh, home and away games as well as uh, behind-the-scenes coverage, uh, interviews, etc. The Celtic one is, I think, $200 a year. Uh, and then for the other teams, it's different pricing too. So it's, this could be – this is, this is a massive change. It's, it's one of those things that uh, it's the clubs going directly to you rather than, say, you going to Fox and watching the games there. So if you're a fan of certain clubs uh, in the Scottish Premiership, it's actually, in some ways, could be a good thing in that you'll be able to see all the games home and away, rather than just relying on Fox in the past, where you might have seen one or two here or there. Um, But still, at the end of the day, it's not good news, I think, for the Scottish Premiership as a whole, especially in the United States, in terms of exposure, because now you're limiting it to streaming, and that goes to the hardcore of the hardcore fans, and uh, doesn't help introduce um, that league to to others that might fall in love with uh, the Ulfham Derby or the the history or tradition and all the things that go around uh, Scottish football. Any thoughts on that one, Kartik, or... uh yeah, that's uh, that's really a, a tough one for Scottish football. I think as a whole, uh, it may be better for specific fans uh, of uh, of uh, clubs that can see every game in this manner now. But as far as the league growing its presence in the U.S., uh, I think that 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 ship is sailed. And, and it's something that I find a little odd because there are so many there are I don't encounter that many Rangers fans 
happens in, in my uh, daily or weekly soccer activities. But I encounter so many Celtic fans. I mean, I want to say I encounter as many Celtic fans, hardcore Celtic fans, as I do fans of, of most English Premier League clubs. And yet there's really no way to, to follow that league in this country uh, without paying over uh, an arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. And, and just as one example, too, the last Old Firm derby that was in the Scottish Premiership, which was back in March, uh, that one was on FS1, I think on a Sunday morning or Saturday morning. Uh, Fox didn't promote it at all, so most people wouldn't have known it was on, but uh, that one had a, uh, a viewership of uh, 73,000. So not a huge number, not a tiny number, but still, um, you would think... Well, it's to... more than they get for a lot of Bundesliga games, which they do promote. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, Kartik, with all the promotion that they put into the Bundesliga. That's a good point there. But it, it is one of those things that, uh, I mean, if you don't promote it, people don't know it's there. It's hard to get some big numbers, which has been the longest thing with Fox for forever, is uh, promote what you got. It's, it's not that complicated. But, okay. Well, speaking of TV ratings, let's move on to that. And uh, some big numbers coming out this past week. Uh, we had 3.8 million people that watched the Mexico-Jamaica match. Uh, that one was the uh, the semi final where Jamaica had won the match uh, surprisingly uh, on the, on Univision and Univision Deportes uh, for that game it was three million and then FS1 had uh, almost uh, eight hundred thousand people for that one uh, the USA Costa Rica semi final that one had two point one million and it was one point one million on Unamas and Galavision and then one million on FS1 so uh, the Unamas and Galavision beat the number for FS1. Um, it was on Unamas and Galavision because I think at that, that night there was also uh, uh, Liga Mekis back on for the new season. And then uh, so as far as some of the other numbers to throw out there too, we had uh, for the Manchester Derby on ESPN, that was 452,000. Pretty decent number for a, uh, a late game on, the, uh, on that network. The Real Madrid against Man United on ESPN had 443,000 people. Uh, Juventus against Barcelona on ESPN, 403,000. Um, and then we kind of get into some of the, the smaller numbers for, for the other games. Um, anything else out there, Kartik, that uh, jumps out at you, some of the, some of the numbers? Yeah, the NWSL number uh, was down again this week. It was down for the first time in a while this week, 81,000 for Pride Red Stars. I should have mentioned this in my summary of games I watched. It, it was uh, That was one game I did watch start to finish. Uh, Christian Press for me right now. Maybe the best American footballer, male or female. Wow. And uh, in terms of MLS, uh, some numbers there, 338,000 for Orlando Atlanta on ESPN. And then we had uh, Minnesota against uh, New York Red Bulls was uh, 222,000. And last but not least, uh, 155,000 for Vancouver against Portland on FS1. Uh, and, and Fox Deportes combined, and that was part of a doubleheader that they had. So they had that match, and that was followed then by the um, Mexico-Jamaica game. So moving on to listener mailbag, and we've got uh, one comment here from someone we know uh, pretty closely, Kartik. This is Robin Burt. He used to be on this podcast, and uh, he sent this in through Facebook. And this is on the topic of last week when we were talking about uh, friendlies and uh, whether they're meaningful or not. And he says, uh, the friendlies are 100% meaningless. I took my, my uh, son to Seattle last July to see our beloved West Ham play the Sounders. It was such a slow and ponderous game. Thankfully, the, the Sounders kind of cared. Otherwise, I would have uh, had to say that uh, I would not wa waste my money on buying another friendly ticket again. We fl flew from Los Angeles to Seattle, spent two nights in a hotel, and then were served up with a load of dreck on the pitch. It's not for me. I can barely watch friendlies on TV. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, our former co-host Robin Bird, I, I tend to agree with him to a large extent. Uh, that's why Manchester City comes to the country every year, and I, I never fly out to see them. I uh, went to see them, I, I think I mentioned last week or previous week on this podcast in 2010, went to see them in 2013, have not gone since, even though they come every year. And by all means, I would normally go, uh, but that's the kind of level you, you've seen. But this ICC is beginning to change my mind about it, this year's ICC specifically, because I think there's a, there's a greater intensity. The, 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 the question is, is it because we're going playing into a World Cup year and next year we're going to see a drop-off again in the level of friendlies, or is it something that might be semi-permanent? And, and we don't have the answer for that right now. But I, I, 
I tend to relate to Robin's sentiments on this. Yeah, I, I disagree with Robin in that uh, I understand where he's coming from, but I, I think it's it's not uh, it, it's not the friendlies' fault. But it's, in this case, it's West Ham United's fault. So I think they think West Ham United doesn't know how to market their team uh, overseas. So if I was West Ham United, I would put out a, a strong team and have them play at a competitive level against the Seattle team because it's an opportunity to go ahead and, and win new fans, sell merchandise and adopt fans. And, and I, I go back to one of my examples, which is I took my daughter to a uh, Chelsea practice, uh, I think before the game against AC Milan a few years ago in Miami. And she, we were just at the practice the night before the game and she got to see you know, John Terry and Lukaku and, and a whole bunch of, uh, of the stars, Frank Lampard. And uh, she was hooked. And ever since that day, she's been a Chelsea fan, <laughs> much to my chagrin. But it's one of those things that it does... If you do it the right way, I think it's an opportunity to make it make it work. But if for West Ham United, if you go in with the the thinking, okay, we just turn up, and then all of a sudden we uh, make a ton of money, and uh, and then we move on, it, that's not, that's a recipe for disaster. And it makes it makes uh, West Ham look bad. It makes uh, these friendlies look bad. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember that about your daughter. I, we, we went to see uh, Everton train a couple of years ago here in Miami, and uh, I, you're, you brought your daughter, and I was trying to convince her to be an Everton fan, <laughs> and she was already hooked on Chelsea. So I know. Uh, it's funny. I'm a Man City supporter, but people who know me and have uh, adopted English fo- uh, football clubs know that I always push Everton on them for whatever reason. Right. So the Kartik, I, I've been accused of being a closet Everton fan. Maybe I am. The Kartik. So Man City, though, you became a Man City fan through a friendly, though, right? Correct. So uh, it just goes to show. Yeah, it just goes to show the the impact that these friendlies can have. It it can it can hook someone for life and say, okay, right. And and sometimes it can be. I mean, so I I think it's it's definitely on the team's part to to put the best effort forward. And I think West Ham in this case uh, did not. Uh, if you do, if you guys do have any questions or feedback or comments, uh, be sure to send those in to us, and we'll be glad to read them out on air, as we did with uh, Robin's comment. And uh, you can reach us through email at web at worldsoccertalk dot com. Twitter is w soccer talk, and then Facebook is facebook dot com slash world soccer talk. So let's move on to our featured topic of the week, Kartik, and uh, oh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll start this one off and f- feel free to chime in. But um, my personal thinking is, is that uh, in terms of what I've seen just in this past week, and this goes back for years, but this week especially so, is that uh, MLS is under attack from International Champions Cup and also this uh, MP and Silver uh, TV deal. My perspective is is that how can MLS compete against ICC when ICC is coming over here every summer, they're getting better TV ratings, they're getting better attendances, and they're generating all of the pe- publicity and attention and, and winning new fans. And in the same week, you got revelations came out that uh, MP and Silver offered uh, Major League Soccer $4 billion to restructure the U.S. soccer pyramid uh, by adding uh, promotion relegation between the different leagues. So these th- these two things together, ICC and then the MP and Silver deal, it's a bad look for MLS. Uh, the league is seen as uh, being on the outside. It seems to be kind of backward thinking, and it's stuck in a generation where it's all about trying to generate as much money for the NFL owners uh, of these MLS clubs instead of trying to grow this, the game in the U.S. And after watching these International Champions Cup games and then watching MLS, uh, MLS looks bad on television, and it feels inferior and that just perpetuates the problem for Major League Soccer when the new European season start in a few weeks. And then you have all of these teams that have come over for the ICC. And now you can see many of them on television, you mean close up, uh, week in, week out, as well as other clubs. And, and to me, at the end of the day, Kartik, the European clubs are in control of the U.S. soccer market for every single month of the year. So you go from August all the way through till to May. In June, you usually have the Champions League and uh, the Europa League. Uh, then in July, they're here. They're here. They're, do- they're dominating this market. And I think that Major League Soccer can't compete. And at the same time, not only can they compete, but I think it's one of those things from the television perspective is that they're in a losing battle where they seem to be stuck to their principles. They're not willing to change, uh, not willing to adopt, um, whether, whether it's the MP and Silver deal or, or other changes that could benefit the league in the United States. And at the end of the day, it's all about where the stars are. 
and the stars are in whether it's European leagues, uh, Liga MX leagues, South American leagues. But uh, it's an equal playing field, and I think for the most part, that's why we're seeing some record numbers, people spending, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of dollars to watch these matches in person, and then for the rest of the year, they're watching it on television. And uh, Major League Soccer, to me, is, is the big loser here. Okay, let's let's uh, uh, separate these two issues. They're two very different issues, uh, because leagues in China, Australia, in India, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, you name it. Uh, if there if there's an English language speaking component in those countries, African countries, they all have the same issues as MLS with things like the ICC, things like European football. It's not something that's going to get solved. It's happening. It's 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 ripping the soul out of the domestic game around the planet um, in, in, in many places. So I, I don't think there's much MLS can do about that other than the fact that there's more money here. There are guys like Stephen Ross who are bringing high-level games here. That's one issue, and that's a, that's a difficult one for MLS. What should not be a difficult one for MLS, but they put themselves in a box, is the other component, which is MP and Silva. Uh, it doesn't have to be MP and Silva. It can be anyone. But the whole conversation of promotion and relegation. For whatever reason, they're really obstinate to having a, 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 an a open pyramid, an open league in this country. And I, I think it's important we acknowledge, because so many people who are on the, the pro-rel side of this argument don't, we have to acknowledge the strides the sport of this country has made thanks to Major League Soccer. The uh, resources that have been poured into play air development and stadiums and just maintenance of a high level first division where players, American players and players from other CONCACAF countries, you see that with Jamaica's success in the last two gold cups, uh, the, the, the core of their team have been MLS based in, in 15 and 17 and got to the finals in, in, in both tournaments, beating us and Mexico to get there in, in re the respective tournaments are MLS based. So the league has done some great things, but if you don't have an open system, if you don't have promotion and relegation, eventually investment dries up in the league. Now, you can say all this. You can you can sell franchises for $150 million. That will eventually come to an end. OK, you're eventually going to hit a law of diminishing returns with that. And there is so much interest in grassroots soccer in this country. The, the, the whole issue of the ICC and European football and the ratings, that's a, a completely separate issue. There is enough energy and interest in grassroots soccer in this country, youth soccer people who are committed to their youth soccer programs, but their programs have been uh, have been uh, frozen out of the U.S. Soccer Development Academy, and they're uh, unable to compete for players at the U15 and U17 levels because of these U.S. Soccer Development Academies. Uh, NPSL and PDL clubs that, have, that uh, uh, are not able to advance up the pyramid. They have ambitious owners. They have people uh, like Roberto Saka down the road here in, in, in Miami uh, with Miami United who have invested a lot of money, a lot of effort, brought a, uh, Adriano to this country, uh, but um, they're blocked in the fourth division level. Then you talk about second and third division. You could go on and on. There is a lot of investment, a lot of interest, and a lot of potential investment in lower division soccer in this country, which would grow the entire sport, in, uh, grow the American player, grow the footprint of this sport in this country where I firmly believe it would be competitive, the domestic leagues, irrespective of how many people are watching Arsenal and Man United and, and, and the ICC and, and European football, competitive with the four major sports that are being gagged by the unwillingness to open up the, the league structure in this country. It is um, a separate issue, and it is, a, it, it is an important issue. Look, I think maybe MP and Silva's $4 billion offer was a bit of a publicity stunt. We know Silva owns the second division team in Miami, and he very badly wants that team to be in the first division. We also know, by the way, Silva, uh, he's not, he, he, he bought in to a closed second division. Uh, I don't believe teams should be able to buy into closed second divisions and move up to the first division because they win a championship. I believe in open systems where you start in the fifth division or you start in the, you do what FC United and Manchester has done. You do what AFC Wimbledon has done. That, that, that's a true open system, right. and that will generate so much more interest and enthusiasm in the sport. Uh, MLS's TV ratings aren't going to get any better, are they, with this structure? Do, right. do you think they will, Chris? No, no, not, not, not at all. I, no. I, 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 still no. think, I still think that, that there is a connection between the two of these. So let, let me explain that, too. So, so from ICC, uh, essentially this is becoming now a global soccer league, a, a summer, a, an annual tradition. And uh, I can see that it, but it is essentially that now, other than in, in name only, in, in it's a Champions Cup. But they could usually turn that around and say, okay, it's now an international Champions 
league, you know, I mean, rather than, than an actual cup, and uh, to make it add a little bit more competitiveness to it. Yes, some teams. Well, gonna... they actually keep a table, so it's it's a little bit of that already. Right. Yeah, I think it's just positioning, but but essentially what they have is is a global summer league, and I think for the United States, I mean, to me, that's that's kind of a slam dunk. I mean, this is exactly what this market's uh, wanting to see is, is Messi and all these stars from around the world uh, playing competitive football. And we've got that. But the connection I see, though, Kartik, is uh, the balance between the two. So with uh, with ICC as, as one example, but really what you have is ICC is a TV product at the end of the day. Yes, there's getting massive uh, attendances, but I see that that future as being more of a TV product as well as generating tons of money from tickets. And I see the balance being that um, in a typical a typical week, say in the summertime, is you're trying to find that balance between, okay, you have enough money to go to um, watch a soccer game in person, so maybe you go see uh, Juve against uh, PSG, but then uh, for the weekend, then, then then you go and say, okay, you know what? I'm going to go watch my local soccer team. So whether it's Major League Soccer, NASL, USL, NPSL, I mean, you go down the list. There's so much uh, there to choose from. But at this present moment in time, I think what's happening is, is that most soccer fans are watching soccer on television. Uh, and unless there's a MLS team right down the road from them nearby, they're deciding not to go to watch these games in person. Um, they're wanting, they'd rather watch it on television or if these teams come to the United States every summer that they'll go and buy, spend a lot of money, spend hundreds of dollars to go watch these uh, teams in person. I, I think there is a way to balance the two where you do have still the, the tele, television aspect where um, the league does, uh, well, the International Champions Cup and the Premier League and you watch the, those games maybe uh, in the morning times. Well, ICC, you know, but Premier League or La Liga or Serie A, you go down the, the long list. And then in the evenings or on the weekends, then you, you take your family or your friends and you, and you go to these games. The issue that we have today is that the way that MLS is structured and the way that the U.S. soccer pyramid is structured is there's a lot of people avoiding those uh, going. They, they don't want to go see an NASL game. They don't want to see an a MLS game because they see that leagues or those leagues as not having stars. They see those leagues as, uh, as being not as competitive or not as good. And but I think that, that's, that's never going to change. Look, they, well, I'm, well, 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 that's Chris, what, I'm saying there are, country, there are other countries. Australia has the same problem. You can talk to anyone who covers the A-League. They have the same exact problem. But, uh, but, but, but I think with the MP Silver deal, though, too, with that injection of money, if they decided to go down that path, that's the best route to go in terms of trying to bolster up, trying to strengthen these leagues, give these teams more funding so that they can go out there. Expect- you are not going to get the star, the biggest stars in this country. Well, I'm sorry. I know people say the NASL did back in the day, but that was pre-Bosman ruling. That was free free movement of labor uh, in your in, within the EU. It's very easy to get an EU passport now, uh, even if you're a South American uh, or if you have Italian ancestry or something, and just move around leagues and clubs in in Europe. I, I just don't, I don't think it's going to happen. So honestly. so what, what's the alternative though? I mean, for for major league there soccer, there is no alternative. The alternative is you're not going to have the top league in the world here. You're not going to have one of the top leagues in the world here. It's to accept what we have in the domestic game, uh, the limitations. But the limitations are greater when you don't take a deal like the MP and Silva deal. Uh, or some sort of deal to open up the pyramid. You can have a very strong domestically based uh, league system, which is relevant to everybody in every community because you have an open league and any team can advance um, advance through that system. And then I think another problem is the USSF Development Academy. You've dealt with this personally, Chris. Uh, it's beginning to choke the life out of youth clubs that are excluded from that uh, uh, thing. That's a whole other discussion, but that's part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, U.S. soccer has promoted a closed league structure. And uh, I think uh, promotion and relegation and open leagues is really – I, I mean, this sounds maybe uh, uh, bombastic or, or, or draconian, depending on your perspective, but it's probably the only long term solution uh, to make the, the sport in this country as relevant as it should be. So the question is, um, I go back to and I, and I hate to bring this up. Ruth Hulett, when he was here um, in Los Angeles Galaxy, Chris, you probably remember this, mm-hmm. made the comment that he felt like after the experience, MLS was a NFL plot to keep soccer <laughs> in a box in this country. And I thought it was it was ludicrous when he said it. Yeah. Now I'm thinking back, but but it's Ruth Hulett, so you have to you have to take it seriously, right? Yeah. His his, uh, his stature demands that. His resume, right? 
Yeah, I, I, I think back and I'm thinking, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily an NFL plot, but it's a lot of NFL trained thinkers that might. I, I don't know if they're necessarily trying to keep soccer down, but there's there, there there's something at play. There's some motivation well, for why they're not willing to open the system up. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's all about greed, I think, because because Don Garber, Don Garber answers to the uh, owners or the investors in Major League Soccer. Most of them are rich NFL owners uh, who are already incredibly wealthy, uh, who own teams such as the New, New England Patriots, etc. People like Robert right. Kraft, and that's who he's answering to. So he's not answering to uh, or focusing on the fans. He's just making or sure he's protecting not their interests. On- the, um, the, 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 the owners of MLS clubs that have come to the league more recently, uh, the guys like the Merrick Paulsons in Portland, who I know has, uh, has pushed the envelope on a couple of issues related to the salary cap, like uh, the Seattle owners, um, like Flavio De Silva uh, here in Orlando, who is, uh, comes from a Brazilian background, obviously, and, is, uh, a- and I think would, be, uh, would, would like some sort of open system uh, and, so, and some ability to compete, uh, with, uh, uh, compete for players because Orlando has, has been in trouble uh, previously. They've been, uh, uh, they've been reported twice to the league by opposing teams for, for poaching or interfering or trying to tap up players, which uh, uh, they're not really tapping up players in an open system. It's not like tapping up in Europe where y- you make an illegal approach. What Orlando's done would be what would be legal in any other system, but they've gotten in trouble for it. So I think Garber, this is a risk with MLS expansion because I think even though they're getting their 150 million a pop, you're bringing in owners who I think are probably more versed in the world game than those NFL owners, unless they just, they, they award expansion teams to four NFL oriented ownership groups, which I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, San Antonio is, was, they might, uh, NFL, NBA oriented groups. But if you bring in some owners that are kind of younger, uh, more versed with the world game, more versed with their fans, there might be some change from within. I mean, keep an eye on Cincinnati if they get into the league. I think that they're very ambitious and their ownership is great. Maybe they don't get into the league. Well, keep an eye on Tampa well, that's, Bay, same thing. Well, that's the thing that's too caught in, in that letter that Silva wrote to Don, Don Garber. He mentioned in there, he started the, the letter off saying, that uh, I've been in contact and, and having uh, some great frank discussions with, with the owners and uh, several kind of uh, decision makers uh, in and around Major League Soccer. And, and essentially, here's what I'm proposing. So there's definitely some buy-in among some of the owners, probably the newer owners, while, say, the Robert Crafts of the world are still kind of stuck in the the uh, in, uh, MLS 1.0 generation where they're not willing to change, they're not willing to, to uh, have any well, open let's system. Let's think about this here. Malcolm Glazer lives here in the state of Florida. Uh, John Henry well, he's, lives he's right here. Well, right, or lived, you know, Joel Glazer lives here in the state yeah. of Florida. Uh, Malcolm Glazer lived in the state of Florida when he bought Manchester United. Uh, uh, John W. Henry, his office uh, was in the same building as my wife's office in Boca Raton. Uh, you're talking about investors here in the United States that have chosen to spend their money on football abroad. It is the best product out there, but they're not they, they're not willing to put any sort of money into the game domestically because there's a there's kind of an upward ceiling. Well, you look, to, uh, you look at Stephen Ross, though. I mean, Stephen Ross is a you know, Ross is another good a, example. A billionaire. Yeah. I mean, multi-billionaire. And he was asked uh, this week, and actually, I don't have the quote in front of me, but he was asked this week, uh, "Why aren't you investing in Major League Soccer?" And he says, "I have no need to." He says, "I have all the best teams from Europe coming here over here every summer, playing in my stadium." And uh, he's also planning on having ICC games throughout the year. So it wouldn't be just a summer thing that he's probably looking for winter breaks or international breaks. And have he's also going to be bringing uh, – he's also probably uh, – I don't know if this has been out there or we're breaking news here. But my understanding is he's also probably going to bring Brazil uh, uh, here a couple times before the World Cup in 2018 to Miami. Wow. But, but, but that's the thing, too. I mean, to me, ICC is Major League Soccer's worst nightmare because it really opens up. So for an average so mainstream person, sports fan who goes to watch one of these games in person, sees the quality of play, sees co- the competitiveness, sees the world stars, that person is probably not going to go to Major League Soccer games uh, unless, unless it's kind of a, a fun family experience and it's a nice night out and it's affordable. That person is going to watch so it on television. Two, two, two. 
two different sets of fans here, though. Those people are never going to go to MLS games. They don't go to A-League games. They don't go to China. Super League games. They don't go to games in the Indian League. Um, but then there are local grassroots oriented soccer people who go to their kid, take, drive their kids to youth games like you do, Chris, uh, that, uh, that, that sometimes go to local fourth division games or NASL games who have no interest in Major League Soccer because there's no way they're the team in their community unless some gazillionaire or comes and says, oh, you know what, I'm going to buy into the closed league structure of MLS. Um, they're actually engaged in the domestic game in this country, and they are preferring to watch the Premier League or La Liga on television, not just because it's a higher level of sport uh, to them, because it's obviously going to be that, but it's also because it has more personal connection to them. Um, MLS has no relevance outside its markets, and I think right. you said that at the beginning of this argument, yep. uh, at the beginning of this discussion, excuse me, and that is really the big takeaway. It has no relevance. The television ratings show us that. You know what? Honestly, in a lot of its markets, it has no relevance in its market. You see that from local television ratings where uh, teams like Salt Lake, Orlando, they do well when their teams are playing away from home on the over-the-air channels or the local cable channels that, they, um, that they're on. But teams like the LA Galaxy, no one watches that team in Los Angeles. No one cares about that team except for the uh, 30,000, 40,000 diehards, most of whom go each week uh, to the Home Depot Center. Yeah. Uh, same thing with the New York team. Same thing with the Philly team. The teams in big markets no one cares about. Yeah, and that's why I think the MLS has to change because I mean, you can watch your – Yeah, yet I have to tell you in some of these big markets, there are very sustainable lower division teams and people who are not going to MLS games because they're like, well, I like the Ventura County Fusion and they're a fourth division team and, oh, and uh, the they can never FC. be first division. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. There's lots yeah. of those. Detroit, Minneapolis. Look, in Minnesota is a new MLS market. That team moved up from NASL. There is a real underground movement. It's not so underground anymore for Minneapolis City FC, which is a fourth division team. Um, and people have bought into memberships to, to that team. There's a team in San Francisco in an MLS market, San Jose Earthquakes, uh, that has done the same and is getting like 2,000 fans a game. These people are buying in and spending their money on the domestic game, and they have no interest in Major League Soccer mm -hmm. because it's a closed league. And, and that's the thing about the MP and Silver deal, too, is that uh, if anyone needed any clarification uh, or a kind of a um, yeah clarification essentially on where MLS is, is at and what they're thinking, this was it in terms of them coming back and saying, like, no, we're, we're not interested. And, yes, there's uh, contractual reasons why they can't uh, talk about it now. They have to wait until the next cycle. But I think it's pretty emphatic, though, too, from MLS's point of view, is that they're not interested in any type of deal where they start to lose control and start to change uh, their vision of what they see uh, as U.S. soccer. I mean, that's that's their vision. And I think at the end of the day, I think there is a way to balance things as far as having your your, your best teams from around the world watching them on television in the mornings or, or uh, maybe Friday nights or whatever, and then going Saturday night to watch uh, your local team. And I, and that's the thing from this past week, Kartik. I've seen just a huge groundswell of just the lower leagues, like fans from around the country that uh, are not in MLS cities that support their local teams that were responding very neg negatively to the MP and Silver deal in terms of MLS uh, saying no to this. And I think that they, they're feeling left out too. Here's a huge opportunity, not just for Major League Soccer, but for the lower leagues in the U.S. And uh, I think we all know at this point and, and where MLS Chris, stands. So maybe I come from a biased perspective. Maybe I come from a perspective of having worked in, in those lower leagues now for a number of years, um, you know, alongside my media work. Uh, I... Um, I think that, that the numbers of those people are far greater than MLS thinks they are. And you know what? I think yep. maybe to a certain extent they've acknowledged it because they, they used to just have these random expansion teams, right? Whoever paid uh, their expansion fee. Now it seems like just about every team they bring into the league is being brought up, with the exception of Atlanta recently and Philly, is being brought up from the lower divisions. They realize there's this groundswell of support that is taking place outside their league. And they're only, they're only play because they're a closed league to try and appeal to fans in those markets to say, hey, you know, if you support your team and you're so supportive that you can attract an investor who has billions, you too could be part of our private little club. <laughs> that, which, that's really their only appeal to these people. Which, which is what they, uh, Don Garber said several years ago to the Strikers fans that were... Yeah, I was in the room I, when he said I, that I was to there us. too. I was there too. So he said basically what you need to do is just increase the attendance and then uh, there's, no, there's no reason why MLS couldn't come into this market in, in South Florida. 
Uh, right. And, and we're all looking like each, at each other. And there are, of course, a whole contingent of people saying, oh, yeah, let's do that because we want to be in MLS. I, I would love for the strikers to have been in MLS also. But there was no that had no relevance to the actual strikers product. And it was basically get your attendance up, find an investor who's willing to to to, to drop uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in, in, in our kind of uh, closed league. And you, too, can be one of us. There is no sporting merit attached to it, which gets back to the larger picture, which is um, it's not relevant to people outside of MLS cities. And um, I think the disconcerting thing. And Chris, to tie a bow on this whole thing, is anytime pro rel comes up, anytime open leagues come up, even from people like me who I think are moderate and nuanced in our position, because I say, OK, it can't happen overnight. We need to bring the lower leagues up to a certain level. And MLS has done a lot of great things for, for soccer in this country and continues to with their investment in, in development academies. That would be the, the real take way now that I would say they're doing well. Uh, I'm not one of those extremists who say, oh, MLS should die. MLS should be, uh, it should go away. And, and they've never done anything. And we've lost 30 years in this country in soccer. I'm not one of those people. But we're at a point where the league has to open up uh, or we have to have an open structure or, or there will be a structure. I think I mentioned this on a previous show. There will be a structure that, that emerges outside of Major League Soccer as much as they've choked the investment in the game there potentially will be something that emerges down the road unless uh, U.S. soccer uh, uh, very uh, uh, openly blocks it, which is tough, difficult for them to do because then they face the possibility of antitrust lawsuits, et cetera. Um, that emerges, but that would emerge over a long period of time. It would be much easier if we had uh, – we have an established first division. They've done a great job of doing that. That's ready to open up and, uh, and make this uh, system – something that is inclusive to everyone in this country and also allows them in some respect to compete with these leagues abroad. I don't think they're ever going to be able to, um, to compete for players at, at the highest level with European clubs. Uh, but uh, I do think that you can compete for the inter entertainment dollars and for the investment dollars of people who are already in soccer in this country. Look, there are people um, who are, for lack of a better term, are Euro snobs. And you have them in Australia, you have them in China, like I've mentioned before, that just watch European football. They have no interest in local soccer. They're not involved in youth soccer locally. They don't watch. They might have a third or fourth division team in their town. It won't be a third division team this season. But they might have a lower division team in their town, and they, they're not even aware they exist. Those people, MLS is never going to win over. So forget it. They're, they're going to ICC games. That's great. They watch Arsenal. That's fine. Um, the the A-League has the same problem. The J-League in Japan has the same problem, et cetera. Um, but there are people who are engaged in the in, in the sport. And, Chris, I have to ask you this in, in closing. Do you think the backlash caught MLS off guard this week, or do you think they just don't care? Because they, they I think if they were in tune to social media, they would have seen how many people there are that support lower division clubs in this country that are uh, furious about this. I think uh, both. I think I think they don't care, and I think they were surprised. So I, I think it's one of those things that uh, they don't care, as in they, they have their model. They're, I mean, the, the name of the game for the Major League Soccer is expansion. I mean, getting in those expansion fees, and that's their focus, right? as well as other things. But that's the main focus, as well as uh, putting more money in the pockets of their investors. Um, I think they were surprised by it, and uh, I'm sure they're hoping that this whole thing dies down and that uh, everyone can move on to, to the next topic. But to me, I think it does prove a point. I think it's ICC plus MP and Silver that the TV deal offer is that MLS has to change in order to still be relevant. I mean, because it's one of those things that on television, it's not working in person. They're doing well in those cities. But like you said, it's going to reach a point where expansion will be over. And now they have to figure out, okay, what's next? Because without those expansion fees, um, that's when the rubber meets the road. And, and that's going to be an incredibly difficult time for them. And they're at, at risk of being left behind. And I think from this past week with the MP and Silver deal, uh, especially so, um, we've, there's been a groundswell. I've just been amazed by how many people at a local level throughout the United States have been responding to this in, in a really negative fashion towards MLS and looking at MLS as, as an outsider, as someone that's stuck in the Stone Ages. And I think really that MLS has to start thinking about, about changing. What they may end up doing at the end of the day down the road is reaching a compromise where it is 
a closed system, but it's with some type of relegation promotion that they can, can control, um, whether it's an application process or something where they can uh, guarantee investors that their money, but then give some semblance of promotion relegation, keep uh, try to keep the uh, soccer fans happy, and it's going to be one of those things that's probably not going to work out that well because it's i mean we we, we can see through that but uh yeah it's f- fascinating times kartik and, and i think at the end of the day mls has a ton of uh challenges ahead of them from the television side especially and from this mp and silver deal uh, that was really a pr masterpiece from them especially the timing of it but with the international champions cup coming up uh, and being played this week putting that on the radar and uh, seeing what the reaction was. And the two things came together at, at, at just the right time for them. Uh, and, uh, yes, I think MLS was surprised, but I think they don't care. All right, Kartik, so where can listeners find you on the Internet if they want to uh, chat with you or, or uh, find out what's, uh, what's your latest stories uh, around the Internet? Yeah, Twitter, uh, KKFLA737. You can find me at World Soccer Talk, uh, the Florida Squeeze.com, uh, uh, ProstAmerica.com, a bunch, uh, bunch of different Yanks are coming.com, a bunch of different websites uh, around, the, uh, around the net. So if you like the show, share it with your friends on social media and uh, be sure to post a, a review on iTunes. We uh, appreciate it greatly. Uh, thanks for listening. You can get a new episode of World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Uh, every episode is released on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, Audio Boom, and WorldSoccerTalk.com. And Kartik, what should they do? Enjoy your football.